master's degree in human services. I have a doctorate in social planning and organizational change. I am a psychiatric rehabilitation practitioner and a certified diversity executive. Now, some may say that's not too shabby. My father would say, and you would have made a great lawyer. <laughs> so the idea being, though, through all three of my degrees and my two certifications, I found that they were painful moments. Some of those moments, I literally cried through those different moments. And I found that it was very, very difficult to navigate how I wanted to exist in the world as a student when I had these pain points as things that were bothering me. Pain points, the literature says, is when a customer is dissatisfied with the organization or group for which they're talking about. Now, I want each one of you to be successful when I'm not around. I'm not going to meet every student that this is going to help. But what's the point of just bringing up pain if I'm not going to be giving you a strategy for how to address it? So today we're going to be looking at that strategy because I have identified what I call the 10 academic pain points. It's very, very important to recognize that these, that these pain points happen to all students, majority students, disenfranchised students, marginalized students, minoritized students. In other words, all students. Now, as I go through this list, you don't have to tell me which ones apply to you, but you may want to identify which ones in number apply to you. I presented this uh, presentation to a doctoral network and asked the same question of the same list, and one of the participants said, upwards of six. So this happens to everyone throughout their academic uh, tenure. One of them might, the first one might be accommodation. Accommodation is when someone needs extra support but maybe didn't ask for the accommodation. Maybe it's looking at racism or first generation students. Also the LGBTQIA community. Looking in terms of individuals who are athletes or individuals who are dealing with behavioral health concerns. And also what I call 2 and 50. And 2 and 50 is when students come into class, sit down, and pray that someone on whatever diversity measure shows up, whatever it happens to be. The student sitting here in the orange shirt might be thinking, well, maybe phenotypically someone's going to show up looking like me. But 2 and 50 means you're not predominant. And that can also be a pain point. So again, think about how many of these address and actually locate in your own intersections. And also think about we have to stop, drop, and address this. These are tuition-paying individuals that we call students, and yet there are individuals here that are going through pain thresholds almost on a daily basis. So let's talk about that. When individuals have pain thresholds, I call those academic bricks on shoulders. It's impossible to get through a day, a week, a month, a year until these things start to bear on you. And what happens is that we, we see anxiety. We see depression. We see suicidality. These are all things that are critical to assert because if we don't address them and give you a technique or a strategy to address them, they can be like bricks on your shoulders. And it's very, very important to be, to be thinking about that. When we're looking at the idea of getting past the bricks on the shoulders, I love this first year myth. There's a theory out there called the first year myth. Well, what happens? You're sitting in front of your laptop when you're in high school, and maybe loved ones are behind you, and you're looking at the brochure of the college or university that you want to go to, and what's happening? Oh, the quad looks amazing. The grass is so green. And what's everyone's walking to class, all excited. They're all looking so beautiful with their backpacks on their backs. But no one's telling you how to navigate that credit card that has your name on there for the first time in your life. No one's asking you or telling you how to decide between going to that party on Thursday night and then having class Friday morning. No one's telling you how to maybe endure or how to face in terms of that imposter syndrome that a lot of undergraduate students feel. It does follow you, but a lot of undergraduate students feel that imposter syndrome. What is that? I'm going to be found out any minute now. So those are issues and concerns that can be like bricks on your shoulders. So what are we going to 
going to try to do here today, try to minimize those. Has anyone here ever had an educational opportunity for where they felt any type of pain? Absolutely. Absolutely. I cried through three degrees. I tell my students that all the time. I literally cried through every last one of my degrees, and my certified diversity executive is a brand new dimension for me, and I still cry through that, wondering if I was going to pass the test. So there are things that we create within our own world that sometimes will impact how we are able to be successful. Also, has anyone ever been in a conversation where they find themselves saying, why did I say that? Or why didn't, why didn't I say that? Or I got nothing. I had nothing, I got nothing. But you know when that conversation happens? After. It happens after you've walked away or after you left the, the premise of that, the being in the, in the vicinity of that person or that issue. So we're going to be talking about the strategy to help bring that back. I mentioned I want you to be successful when I'm not around. I am a behavioral health specialist. As soon as you move, it means something to me. So I want you to understand that I'm going to help you move past today for whatever number you came up with on the earlier slide. I'm going to call it the first five words, and we're going to get into that in just a, just an actual moment. In terms of the first five words, now we're not going to be anal about it. It could be four words, it could be six words, it could be 11 words. But the idea is we cannot continue to have anxiety, depression, and potential for suicidality amongst tuition-paying individuals that are seeking to go from where they are to where they want to be, graduation. So the first five words is a, is a method by which to get the words out, to say something in response to what's happening in the moment so you don't walk away knowing, why didn't I, why didn't I, I had nothing. So this five word strategy we're going to apply to the top three academic pain points Yes, I researched the other seven, but these are the three that happen most commonly in academia. Accommodations. Accommodations in middle school and high school are referred to as IEPs, Individual Education Plans. What's the point of these things? To help students be successful to graduation. For those of you that may not be familiar, when a faculty member gets an accommodation, it doesn't tell us about the disorder or diagnosis. It tells us what the student needs to be successful. Remember I mentioned I want you to be successful when I'm not around. First day of class, whether it be first year students or seniors, the first day of class, I tell every last one of the students in class, if you need an accommodation, get one. Don't listen to the knucklehead who told you in high school, oh, you had an IEP, you should be good in college. Because the accommodation is there to help you be successful. But what's going to happen when you sit in class and you hear someone say something that jeopardizes your comfort with your accommodation? What is going to be your first five words? Because the first five words may be coming after the first five words may be coming after the inability to maybe maybe someone says something like, "Why do those students get accommodations? It's so unfair." Be thinking, what might be your first five words? It may not be even relevant to you. Perhaps you're advocating for a friend. Perhaps you're advocating for a roommate that you just met. Maybe you're advocating for a sibling who's going to come behind you. But what could be your first five words? I wish I had time to go into the audience to ask, but maybe it could be something like, I heard accommodations are helpful. I don't know how many words that was. You can count them back later. But something has to be said to get the ball rolling. Also, in terms of first generation students. So now we have students, is anyone here a first generation student? I can raise my hand high for that and my siblings. I'll raise my hand, there's four of us, for our siblings. What's going to happen? Now again, by definition, a first generation student is someone whose caregivers, <laughs> parental or guardianship, does not have a four year degree. And then sometimes students will say something like, nobody in your family has went to college? Nobody in your family has a degree? You hear that high pitch? I 
love the high pitch. It, 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 it just motivates me, right? So then, what are going to be those first five words? What can that person say? Or what might you say this happens in class to advocate for another student who might have already shared with you that they're a first generation student? Now, sometimes the first five words that come to my mind, I have to skip over. And I've got to pick another first five words, depending upon what came out of that individual's mouth. But nobody went to college in your family? Again, thinking about what could be your first five words. Maybe something like, do you think first generation students are different? Are first generation students different? Aren't we all students? Aren't we all students? Oh, I got away with four. But whatever it is in terms of being able to get that conversation started. The last pain point that I want to recognize today is in terms of race. Now, this is not a talk about whether race is a social construct or whether it is looking at in terms of, of terms of whether or not it's a human race or this is not a critical race theory talk. I'm talking about when someone picks a phenotype and tries to make the other person feel poorly because of that phenotype. So what's going to happen when you're in class, in the quad, at the CAF, on campus, and someone says something like, I don't like those students. Or, how did they even get here? These things happen on a daily basis. These kinds of comments, I've had students come to me and bring even uh, faculty-based comments like, oh, I don't think that you're going to encounter those people when you get into the field. And the student's sitting there thinking, I think that was, I think I'm those people. But what could be the first five words that you're going to have to be able to process through? In terms of looking at it from the moving forward in terms of the next slide. So for those of you that aren't aware, 35% of incoming undergraduate students are first generation. So you are not alone. You are not alone, but I think people feel that they are alone because they don't recognize that this is a very, very high number. So in terms of race, be thinking about what could that be that you could advocate for someone what could that be that you could say to help support minimizing those bricks on the shoulders of those students that might hear this Monday at 9, Tuesday at 1, Thursday at 3, that's the end of their scholastic week, but they didn't say anything. And these things begin to build up. It's very important to have the strategy to be able to talk through the first five words. And we're having. So the next thing I want to share with you in terms of is looking at it from the perspective of diversity on campus. Diversity on campus is so important. It's so important to be able to look around and say, this is valuable. Not just race, not just social economic status. It could be anything. It could be height. It could be career. It could be discipline. It could be where someone flew in from. It could be their international student. You should use all of these opportunities to grow. Drexel would be remiss if we didn't offer these opportunities to students. It's very, very critical to be able to say that we have a diverse campus, and again, across any measure, but they should not end up being academic bricks on shoulders nor academic pain points. I want to share a story with you, a story about a little girl. A little girl who had a speech impediment. The little girl was a profound stutterer. And her second grade teacher, Mrs. Coffin, said to her, well, why don't you find someone in your life who you would like to emulate so that you don't find yourself perhaps stuttering. And the little girl chose her mother, who she just adored. And she watched how her mother spoke. Now, her mother was raised in Alabama, educated in Massachusetts, and the little girl lived in Pennsylvania. It was dialect hell, but the little girl would watch how her mother would move her lips. 
little girl would side up against her to see the reaction of people as she spoke. Then Mrs. Coffin said to the young girl, why don't you find something else to do besides worrying about your speech? Maybe a sport. And the little girl said, I'm going to pick basketball. And she said, because you don't have to talk in practice or in the games. As a little girl went to middle school and high school, she found that she liked to help her peers. She really appreciated when they would recognize that even though they would sometimes laugh at her, or she'd hear the din of them pointing and just, just having their way with her in terms of picking on her. But she found that if she could just help them through the concepts, it was just fine. After college, that young girl decided that she was going to go into training in evidence-based practices that were now upcoming and relevant in the behavioral health system. So that young lady started doing national trainings and found that even though there was moments of stuttering, stammering and stuttering, she found that, hey, it still benefited the listeners. And then from her international, she went into international around the world. She started doing presentations on behavioral health in Pakistan and in Egypt, Singapore, Malaysia, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Ghana, Cameroon, Egypt. She found that her ability to share, despite the fact that sometimes there was a stutter or a stammer, and then on May 6th, 2023, this young lady also presented her first TEDx. So we found that it's so important to recognize, think about the young girl. Think about how many times I would have wondered and wished if I had the first five words. I didn't have that strategy, but I want you to have that strategy. I want students who are gonna hear this talk, students that I will never meet, to also have this strategy. Because why? I want students to be successful when I'm not around. No more bricks on shoulders.